So far, we have talked about what the dependency injection is in general and what are the capabilities of a dependency injector tool. We are starting with dependency injector inside the spring, which comes by the names of application context container or bean factory. So as you remember from the previous sessions, the almighty dependency injector provides instances of classes that you ask for. And it somehow injects and provides the inner dependencies of the requested object. For example, in the case of the car class, it is dependent on engine and gearbox, and the engine itself is dependent on cylinders, and there might be more depth to this object graph. So the provider of a car object should know every detail about how to access and instantiate and initialize the dependencies and also about the dependencies of the dependencies. Like when you do it manually, you try to find out how to wire objects together in order to make it operable. But this time, the dependency injector has to know all those details to do the same thing on your behalf. And believe me, it's not by guessing or any magic. Okay, the dependency injector cannot find out on its own about the details of how to make an object to come into being. It has to be taught and trained, and the knowledge has to be transferred to the dependency injector. This process is called configuring. So a dependency injector has to be configured by the programmer in order to be able to provide. Each tool has its own way of being configured. Spring has evolved throughout the time and nowadays it provides three distinct configuration methods that programmers can choose to transfer their knowledge and train and configure the tool. Like any other tool, the Spring first started with the powerful XML configuration. Inside the XML configuration, you have to create at least one node for every single class that is either dependent or a dependency of some other class. So it is obvious that the configuration has to know how to find and instantiate a class. It also has to know how to find the dependencies classes and instantiate them as well. These nodes inside the XML file are called beans and each node is a bean definition. We'll define what a bean is and we'll talk about its origins in the next video. As you can see, each bean definition node specifies a bunch of information about how an instance should be provided and how its dependencies should be injected and other information that we will come back shortly. Okay, we saw how the XML configuration works. Inside XML file, we can put all the knowledge that the dependency injector tool needs to know to be able to operate. Then we can pass that XML file to class path XML application context class or file system XML application context class, uh, which are inside the Spring framework. And those classes grab the XML configuration and uh, provide an application context that is ready to provide. But XML has its own flaws. As you know, writing and maintaining a verbose XML file is cumbersome and difficult for humans, especially in, inter in enterprise projects that it might include hundreds of nodes. It is also a text-based file and it is disconnected from the compiled environment of your project that contains all of the classes. And without proper tooling, the programmer can introduce bugs and define wrong nodes that will only be caught at runtime. The second generation of configuration methods in this spring is annotation-based configuration. With the rise of annotation feature inside Java 5, many tools try to employ them to get rid of the verbose and boilerplate stuff. Spring 2.5 introduced annotation-based configuration 
which shrink the XML files substantially. So now, instead of writing XML nodes, the programmers could define bean definitions by annotating their own classes by add component annotation. So as you remember, each XML node was a bin definition source. And in order for annotations to replace those, they had to provide some mechanism for programmers to specify the information that constructs a bin definition. In that sense, for example, they had to specify how their dependencies had to be injected and so forth. Which as you have guessed, it was done with annotations as well. After annotating your classes, you simply create a annotation configuration application context and tell it to scan and find all annotated classes to produce bean definitions. The annotation-based configuration has replaced most of what XML configuration had to offer and is widely used nowadays. But as you might have guessed, it has some flaws on its own. First off, you can only annotate your own classes that you have access to their source codes. And if you need to define a bean definition that you don't own the class, it is not possible to open the source code inside libraries and frameworks in order to annotate them. Also, one could introduce only one bean definition per class by annotating it. And if you need multiple bean definitions uh, from the same class, it would be uh, possible only by XML configuration. So you have to use XML configuration in a hybrid uh, fashion along your own annotated classes. Another flaw is that by annotating your class, um, you are coupling yourself to the Spring Framework. And other than the design issues, you might not be able to use your class outside a Spring container. But with XML, the configuration file was something outside the source code without introducing any coupling. Next stop is the shiny Java-based configuration, which is the third method of configuring Spring. This type of configuration obsoletes and replaces the XML config. It has all the goodies of XML configuration and none of its downsides. With Java configurations, you can introduce a Java method as a source of a bean definition. The bean definition properties will be captured by other annotations on top of each method and the instance itself will be accessed by invoking the at bean annotated method. In this way, you will have the full control on how to write the logic of instantiation and initialization per bean definition. The Java-based configuration is always used in hybrid fashion along the annotation-based configuration, and they complement each other. So we enumerated the three methods of configuring Spring Container. Let's recap what we learned so far. The dependency injector or the container or the application context in the case of Spring has to be trained to know how to find, instantiate, and initialize object. That was the first fact. The second fact is that each class has its own dependencies and details of instantiation. The third fact is that this information about each class is gathered into spe special structure named bean definition. The bean definitions are gathered from all sources of configuration files and loaded into the Spring container or application context object. And at last, the application context, which is loaded with those bean definitions, uh, has the proper knowledge about how to instantiate and initialize classes, and it can answer your needs and provide objects. In the upcoming videos, we will dig into each method and start writing programs. But because the XML configuration method is not used that much, uh, we won't spend time on it. 
And if you are forced to maintain some legacy code with XML configuration, uh, you will be fine on your own only by accessing the official documentation.